Good evening, everybody. It is good to be with you tonight as we uh, continue our study of the book of Isaiah. We are going to pick up in Isaiah chapter 57 here in just a moment or two. Isaiah chapter 57, uh, as we get started, if you will, please join with me in a word of prayer. Our Lord, our Father, we are grateful to you for the uh, time that we can gather here and to uh, study from your word. We are thankful for your servant Isaiah and the message that he has recorded for us. We're thankful, Father, for you granting us understanding, helping us, Lord, to uh, see these truths and to apply them uh, in our own ministries and in our own lives. Lord, we ask that you'll be with us in Jesus' name. All right, so here in chapter 57, we begin the last section of the book of Isaiah. Chapters 57 through 66 represent the last uh, collection of, of writings and, and uh, uh, teachings from Isaiah. Uh, he begins with uh, several chapters, uh, 57, 58, and 59, all dealing with the various sins uh, of, uh, of Israel that are going to lead to their downfall. Uh, he, he speaks of idolatry, uh, injustice, uh, oh, I missed one, uh, and uh, false worship. So uh, in addition to this, he's then going to go on uh, beginning in chapter 60 uh, to focus as he closes the book out about the glory of uh, the future kingdom, the glory of restored Zion, but not necessarily physically restored Zion. Remember, this is still on the on the eve of the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. This is still prior to Nebuchadnezzar marching on the city. Um, and so, yes, the, the physical destruction and then the physical restoration of the city are forthcoming, but that's not really the view that Isaiah has in mind as he's talking in these last chapters. It's not necessarily about physical restoration as, as it is the spiritual restoration of Israel and eventually, as we understand it today, the church. Um, so we see here, uh, looking to chapter 57, uh, that he begins with somewhat of a general rebuke uh, for the people. If I could have a volunteer read verses 1 and 2, please. The righteous perishes, and no man taketh to heart. Merciful men are taken away, while no one considers that the righteous is taken away from evil. They shall enter into peace, but shall rest in their beds. Each one walking in his righteousness, unrighteousness. That's okay. Thank you. Okay, so as we look at this text, uh, what is what is God rebuking Israel for in these first couple of verses? For those that are looking to God uh, are being taken away. Okay. But what's the so the the righteous are dying? But what's the response of the people? They don't care. That's what he's really marking is the fact that good people are dying and nobody cares. They just, they don't care. They're, they're too consumed with their own ways, their own paths. Um, I, I love also the way that he phrases this because... Um, it's not necessarily an entirely negative thing for those who fall. How does he describe it? How does he describe it from the perspective of those who are dying? They shall enter into peace. Okay, they're entering into peace. What else? They're spared from evil. They're spared from evil. There are benefits to going to God, are there not? Okay, so God is saying that the the wicked are not marking the deaths of the righteous, but the righteous are 
enjoying, if you will, not, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, they're enjoying the fruits of their righteous walk. I mean, that is one of the greatest gifts, one of the greatest promises of, uh, of eternity, of heaven, is yes, in God's sight, but also that means there's not wickedness. We don't have to question people's motives. We don't have to question people's statements. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to face temptation. We don't have to be surrounded by evil anymore. None of us truly has any idea what that is like. Honestly, we don't. Maybe as small children before (laughs) this world takes that innocence from us, but even then, we didn't really understand what we had, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that there's any, uh, any lack of connection to John's statements at the close of Revelation and the fact that he had watched all of his friends die. That he had lived a, a very difficult and long life. Remember, he's in exile <laughs> as, he pins the, as he pins those words. He then launches into the evil specifically that is so captivating the people that they don't seem to care um, about the loss of these good influences, about the loss of these good individuals. He speaks of, of them as sons of a sorceress, an offspring of an adulterer, and a prostitute. God's not mincing any words here, is he? They are illegitimate in every conceivable way, is what he is saying. And yet they still are trying to cling to some perceived right to be called the people of God. In verse 5, it says that they inflame themselves among the oaks and under every luxuriant tree, and they slaughter their children in ravines under the clefts of the crags. These are uh, our poetic references to idolatrous worship. Um, specific to the area of the land of Canaan, uh, and we see this uh, throughout Israel's history, um, mentions of the groves or sometimes the Asherah. It was a common practice for the people of the Canaanite lands to use groves of trees, especially groves of trees planted on top of hills, as places of worship to pagan goddesses specifically, often goddesses of fertility. The references to the slaughtering children in the ravines uh, is undoubtedly a reference to uh, the worship of Molech which involved child sacrifice. And yes, Isaiah is indicating that at least some in Israel have unfortunately followed that path. Yes, this is poetic, but it's not necessarily out of out of the range of how far they've gotten. He says that it's to these things that they are pouring their drink offerings. It is on high and lofty mountains they have made their bed. This is where they are trying to put their hope, their strength, their trust. And it's not going to work out well. He picks up in verse 11 of chapter 58. If I could have a volunteer read verses 11 through 13, please. satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. Gary, I, uh, sorry to interrupt, but I think you're in chapter 58. You said 58. I'm in 57, I'm sorry. Okay. My mistake. Okay, 11 through 13. 13, please. 13? 
Yes. Okay. Whom have you so dreaded and feared that you have been false to me, and have neither remembered me nor pondered this in your hearts? It is not because I have long been silent that you do not fear me. I will expose your righteousness and your works, and they will not benefit you. When you cry out for help, let your collection of idols save you. The wind will carry all of them off, and your breath will blow them away. But the man who makes me his refuge will inherit the land and will possess my holy mountain. So what's going to happen to these people who have made their beds in these high places and have put their trust in these uh, idolatrous worships? Yeah, let your ro- I, lo- I like the way you put that, Gary. Let your rocks save you. He said, your cries are going to disappear on the wind. You, you, uh, he says, you, you didn't even remember me. You didn't give me a single thought. In essence, he's saying, so why should I come to your aid? Now, God is good, <laughs> and he's not ever going to utterly abandon his people, but they've brought this on themselves, right? And he gives them the way back, right? He gives them the way to have his aid, to be in his good standing. And what is that? Well, he's painted, he's painted the picture of those who worship him and remain faithful and those who do not. Um, it would seem a pretty easy choice, but Some, it's not going to be a pretty picture. Yeah. God has always said that those who turn to him will have safety, right? And he says that again here. He says those who seek him for refuge will be saved. The idols cannot save, but God will. He goes on in verses 14 through the end of the chapter... And he talks about how it is that he's going to deliver his people. He speaks of removing all of the obstacles from their way, reviving the contrite and the lowly, lifting them up. He also promises in verse 16 that he's not going to continue to be angry forever, that he will turn away from his anger, that he will lead his people back, he will comfort them, but there will still be those who refuse. He's saying that there are going to be those of Israel that are going to learn this very difficult lesson. Those that are going to see what God is about to do to Israel with the hands of the Babylonians and others, and they're going to understand and they're going to turn back. But unfortunately, He says in verse 21, there is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Unfortunately, even as their kinsmen, their fellow Israelites, are are again seeking the peace of God, there will still be those who rally against him. Those who refuse his promise of hope and safety. Then we get to chapter 58, and this is where he speaks of their, he's already spoken of their idolatrous worship, and here he speaks of their vain worship, their empty worship. Uh, I've mentioned before, but at no point in time in Israel's history do we ever see them as a nation wholly abandon the worship of Jehovah. They horribly, horribly taint it. They twist it. They put uh, idolatrous uh, 
altars, couldn't think of the word, uh, next to his altar. But to their credit, they never wholly abandon the worship of God, the worship of Jehovah. However, that doesn't mean that it was acceptable. And this is what he addresses in chapter 58. Even as he calls out for Isaiah and others to call to his people, he says, Cry loudly and do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet and declare to my people their transgression and to the house of Jacob their sins. Is God going to bring this judgment upon his people without warning? No. In fact, men like Isaiah are exactly what God used to warn his people over and over and over again, right? He says in verse 3, well, verse 2, he says, They seek me by day and by uh, day, day by day and delight to know my ways. But they also don't do it right. He says in verse 3, they, they, we have fa- uh, Why have we fasted and you not see? Why have we humbled ourselves and you not notice? Behold, the day of your fast, uh, you find your desire and drive hard all your workers. But look at verse 6. Is this not the fast which I chose to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke? The seeds of Phariseeism were not planted in the first century. And this is so much of the way that people tend to respond, right? Okay, um, and, and I, I've been, it's been presented to me as this pendulum and I, and I really like the metaphor and so I'm using it, okay? Let's say that the middle is where God wants us to be. And by and large, that's a great way to describe where God wants us to be, is in the middle, okay? But what happens is that something happens from either a social or an economic or some other influence that allows that is allowed into the hearts of God's people and it begins to push out to one side or the other whether this is in the as in the sin of idolatry into doing practices that are wholly forbidden uh, you know these types of things And so instead of being here in the middle where we're supposed to be, God's people get pushed out over here. And then people begin to see, well, we're not where we're supposed to be. We're not in the middle anymore. And they begin to push back. But in their zeal, they forget where to stop. Where should they stop? In the middle. But what do they do? They keep pushing and they come out to the other side and and where once maybe everything was permissible, now nothing is permissible. They see what they're saying? They're saying, we've humbled ourselves and you don't seem to care and we've fasted and you don't seem to notice. But they're not doing it for God. Right? Right? They're doing it to do it. They're doing it to be noticed. They're doing it for the attention of it. And they're binding these things. And God says, what I wanted is not fasting. God only ever commanded Israel to fast one day a year. On the Day of Atonement. And it's actually the only place in all of the Bible where a regular occurrence of fasting is ever commanded. That's not to say that the Bible is not full of reasons that we should fast and there's not and there's plenty of times where the Bible speaks of fasting being of great benefit. 
But as is the case when we tend to then push that pendulum way off to that other side, we lose focus. And that's what they did. They started doing these things for the sake of doing them because they thought that the action itself is what made them holy. And that's not the case. Instead of caring for others, instead of, as he says in verse 7, dividing their bread with the hungry and bringing the homeless into their house to cover the naked, they've become overly obsessed with this very burdensome but very empty worship. And so we've got these two sides of this pendulum, right? But neither extreme is where we need to be. And so often this happens. And, and, and if you look through the history of, of the church and you look through the history of Israel, you see the pendulum shifting. Still, still true in the church today. Oh, absolutely it is. Absolutely it is. And that's what God says here. He says, if they would get back to the middle, if they would get back to doing what God asked, yes, that is absolutely important. But not trying to add to what God asked and instead spending that effort in doing better things for those around you, which, by the way, is something that God asked for. <laughs> But see, that's that's the that's the trick, right? And it's the same thing that God there or that Jesus calls the Pharisees to the mat, right? Is that by binding all of these extra things, they still aren't following the word of God, right? Because they're still uh, they're still forgetting, for example, to take care of the needy. They're, they're still failing to do things that God commanded them to do. They just look better, at least in their own minds, than those over here who are practicing idolatry, but God condemns both. And that's what we have to learn from Scripture, is that both extremes, pretty much any extremism is not good. Anytime you find yourself taking any sort of militant, unwavering stance for something, it had better be because God himself said to take that stance. And I mean, you better be able to quote book, chapter, and verse. Beyond that, we run the risk of falling into one of these outside areas. And that's really what he says here at the close of chapter 58. In verses 13 and 14, he calls them back to, to the simplicities of the law. He says, just keep my Sabbath. Even there, he's calling them out for the fact that they have this overly accentuated, this highly trumped up version but they're not keeping the Sabbath. They're running roughshod over one of the foundational aspects of the law. He says, delight in the holy day of the Lord, honor it and uh, desisting from their own ways, desisting from seeking their own pleasures, desisting from speaking their own word. He says, just come back to the middle. Come back to me. And then it would, as it, as it, is, as it would seem, you know, of course, 
when God says, don't be over here, and he says, don't be over here, what do people do? Well, then where should we be? That's, the, that's what chapter 59 begins with. He says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor his ear so dull that it cannot hear. What's keeping God from his people? According to verse 2. Sin. Sin. It says God, God says, it's not that I can't get to you, it's that you keep throwing things in between us. Kind of like in the movies, right? When somebody's trying to run away from somebody pursuing them and they're knocking trash cans over and trying to throw anything they can behind them. It's as though Israel's running down this hallway saying, God, save me, as they throw everything they can get their hands on at God as he pursues them. As they run their own way away from him. Why isn't he helping me? And here in chapter 59, he specifically calls them out for the sin of injustice. As everyone is out for their own, only for their own good, and they take advantage of anybody that they can. We often see this, or maybe just imagine this, I think, as only the rich taking advantage of the poor. And God does often couch it in those terms, but it's not just that. For example, he mentions in verse 4, a falsehood in, in legal matters. He says, no one sues righteously and no one pleads honestly. Can a poor person sue another poor person unjustly? Yeah. Can a, can a, can a rich person lie against another rich person in order to subvert them? So, yes, there are a lot of times where God, you know, speaks to the rich taking advantage of the poor, but it's not exclusive, right? It's not exclusively only that the rich are evil. That's not what he's talking about here, even, necessarily. It's just the idea that they are, well, they're cutthroat with their brethren. I like the imagery in verse 5. They hatch adder's eggs and weave the spider's web. He who eats of their eggs dies, and from that which is crushed, a snake breaks forth. Everything they do is full of venom and hatred. But God then begins to speak in verse 9. Maybe of a turning point. Can I have a volunteer read verses 9 uh, through 12, please? Therefore is judgment far from us, neither is there justice overtake us. We wait for life, but we hold obscurity for righteousness, but we walk in darkness. Yes. 
holy. We know this. Thank you. What's going to bring about the change? The people. The people finally realizing that they're stumbling around like blind people, right? Them finally realizing that it doesn't have to be this way. I don't have to live like this. More than that, there has to be an admission of sin, right? An acknowledgement of what the real problem is. Because is the problem with God? Has God ever asked too much of, too, of humanity? He tells us no. But he doesn't ask too much. No. It's only us who ever makes it seem as though God asked too much. It's only our selfishness that makes it seem so. But the real problem is between us and God, between anyone and God, is their sin. Right? Was God happy to walk in the garden with Adam and Eve? At first? Yeah. What got in the way? Sin. God desires to walk amongst his people. There's, there's just this one little thing in the way, right? But there again, that's the beauty of the hope. That's the beauty that God is here from this point on really going to unravel before them and to try to show them this better way. And, he, and as I said, he's not going to couch it in exclusively or entirely in the idea of it being physical restoration. Because did the people have to be restored back to Jerusalem? Did they have to rebuild the walls of the city in order to turn back to God? No. Now, yes, the temple would have to be restored in order for worship under the law to be brought back or the tabernacle resurrected, right? But was there necessarily anything about Israel being in Babylon or being in Persia or being in modern-day Turkey or in Egypt or anywhere else in the world that would prevent them from acknowledging what we see here, that they had sinned and that they needed to turn back from their ways. No. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? In fact, it would be that very act, right? It would be people following the lead of men like Daniel and Ezekiel while in those captive places. People who staggered back to Israel but needed men like Ezra and Nehemiah to show them that it wasn't enough to simply be back in a physical location. But that it was about coming back to God that it was about serving him no matter your place. Think about this. For essentially his entire adult life, Daniel never worshipped in the temple. In fact, depending on how you take the, the way of the law, there is a possibility that because he was such a young man, that Daniel maybe never participated in temple worship. But would any of us say that Daniel was a not a true follower of God? 
No, because he made the best of the situation that he found himself in, right? Because even as we just looked at in chapter 59, it didn't matter how grand they made the worship in the temple. It didn't matter how many linen ephods they put upon false priests. It didn't matter how many cows, how many lambs, how many turtle doves they led to the slaughter, how much oil and uh, uh, grain was cast into the fire. If their heart wasn't in it, did any of it matter? No. No more than worshiping rocks and gold and silver did, right? have a volunteer read verses 19 through 21 of chapter 59, please. From the west, men will fear the name of the Lord, and from the rising of the sun, they will revere his glory. For he will come like a pent-up flood, as the breath of the Lord drives along. The Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. Yes, please. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you, and my words that I have put in your mouth, will not depart from your mouth, or from the mouths of your children, or from the mouths of their descendants from this time on and forever, says the Lord. God is promising to be with his people, right? Promising always to be there as a guide. That's what he means when he says that their, their word, his words will not depart from their mouths. He's not necessarily promising that there will always be a prophet. But that they will always be guided by the words of God. So long as they keep them. Where? In their hearts and in their mouths, right? I, I know I say this a lot, but I just love the poetry that God uses, right? He says, they will fear the name of the Lord in the West, and from the rising of the sun, they will see his glory. So what parts of the earth are not going to understand the fear and glory of God? No part. Exactly. And that Redeemer will come, but who is he coming for? Say it a little louder, Frank, because I heard, I heard it, but I don't know what anybody else did. The repentant, those who walk in the light, absolutely. We need to see this, that even for Israel, God was not promising blanket restoration just because the blood of, of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was in their veins. Who was going to be redeemed? The repentant. So yes, God is going to physically restore the nation of Israel following the captivity, but what's the real restoration he has in mind? Is it about a city? About walls? About fortifications? No. Absolutely. And it's one of the lessons that Israel struggled with throughout its history. And it's one that we have to be careful that we don't get caught up in the same trap of doing. Is that God wants our heart, you know, as, as he said, we're, uh, 
love the Lord your God with all of your heart and mind, soul, spirit, and body, right? I think I, oh, I think I said one too many in there, but you get the point. That's what he wants. But it's also going to lead them in a, in a place, right? He's preparing them for something, isn't he? Isn't he? Because the spiritual restoration, this glorification that he's talking about, this Redeemer from Zion, is he going to lead them into another 1,500 years of Judaism? Nope. And so what do they have to see? They have to see that following God is not about, well, to an extent, it's not about Judaism, right? I mean, it is for them, right? Because they're, they're Jewish. They're, they have to follow the law. But ultimately, it's about following God, right? Because was Abraham a Jew? No, he was not. He was a Hebrew, the father of the Hebrew people, if you will, the father of the race. But he was not Jewish. He never lived under the law. But again, like Daniel, is there any doubt that Abraham was fully devoted to God in his way and in his time? No, right? That's the very reason that God picked him, right? Because not only was Abraham a man who himself was devoted, but God said, this is a man who will teach his children to follow after me. God's trying to make a point here, and I'm trying not to beat it like a dead horse, but the point's pretty clear, right? If you want the peace, if you want redemption, if you want you know, to know the way, if you want glorification, you know, all of those things that he speaks of, and he doesn't, you know, we often speak of, of being glorified as human beings in an entirely negative light. It's only negative if we're the ones trying to do the glorifying. Right? But God says, if you want those things, well, then follow me, and I will lead you there. Wherever that may be. You know, I, I often reflect on these things, especially when we think about the lives of like the prophets, for example. On one hand, you've got men like Isaiah, who God led into the chambers of kings. Daniel like him. On the other hand, you've got men like Amos or Ezekiel, who dwelt among the people and taught hard lessons to a hard people. But that doesn't make Isaiah or Daniel's ministry better, right? They each had to make do with what they had. I like to think about Daniel and, and Ezekiel especially as these men labored during the captivity, right? You had men like Isaiah, you had men uh, like Joel and, and others who were, who were warner, those who were supposed to warn, right? Habakkuk, trying to warn the people of what the impending doom was. But then the difficulty... of standing in the rubble and proclaiming the word of God the way that Daniel and Ezekiel did. To a very broken people, yes, but sadly at times still a people not quite ready 
to turn back the way that they should. Because undoubtedly, right, people are going to blame God for what happened, right? I have, I have a lot of respect for all of the prophets, but I don't think that Daniel and Ezekiel always get their due. Don't get me wrong, I don't envy Jeremiah being put in a muddy, goopy cistern and fed with nothing but bread and water. But I also don't envy Ezekiel cooking his food over dung and walking around naked for years at a time, trying to prove points. We'll get there, hopefully. We're almost done with Isaiah. We'll do a whirlwind view of Ezekiel on our way to Revelation, Lord willing. But for tonight, we'll pause here. Thank you. You'll take out your songbooks and turn to page 772 and put your marker there. We'll sing that song for an invitation. Shall we sing verses 1, 2, and 4 of 772? Once you put your marker there, I need you to turn to 645. 645. The old rugged cross. What I'm going to try to do is sing all four verses first, and on the fourth verse, we'll sing the chorus, if I can remember that. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and blessed for a world of lost sinners was slain. Oh, the old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. In that old rugged cross stained with blood so divine, a wondrous a beauty I see. For twas on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. To the old rugged cross I will ever be true. It's shame and approach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophy at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown
we are in the midst of what very, uh, a large number of those living in this community and around us celebrate as Holy Week. If you aren't up on your uh, traditions, uh, it begins on Palm Sunday, last Sunday, which celebrates the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem for the last time, and it's capped this coming Sunday with Easter, the celebration of the resurrection. Here we find ourselves on Wednesday, the day before, if you will. Now, Jesus does a lot that last week. But things really kind of get going on their own on Thursday. It is that day that, the, that Jesus and his disciples celebrate the Passover. And it's on that day that he is betrayed and begins the chain of events that would lead to his death, burial, and resurrection. But I want to think about those things that kind of go in between, because that's where we are, right? It's interesting to me, all that happens, and, and we don't have time to look at it, because of course there's well, four gospel accounts and things, but Jesus comes and he cleanses the temple, he discusses with the, the apostles what true worship and true sacrifice are, looking at the widow and her might. He has to squash discussions amongst the apostles as to who is the greatest amongst them. He uses the temple that may, the temple and the temple mount and the city of Jerusalem itself that so many are looking to, maybe even those very disciples. As the, as the foundation of their lives, of maybe misunderstanding that they are thinking that they are the foundations of who God is and, and what it means to be God's people. And he even talks about those stones being cast down and rising, raising them up again in three days, and they don't get it. And all of that with Jesus knowing what's coming tomorrow. Think about that. Jesus knew what was coming. He even knew the manner, right? Because that's what he prays about in Gethsemane. And yet, he spends all of that time teaching, trying to help them to understand, trying to lead more people, trying to prepare the apostles, right? even as he knows the next day they're going to make the preparations for that event that we so often refer to as the Last Supper. He knows that Judas has already plotted. He has already gone and sold Jesus. He knows the promise that Peter and the others are going to make and he knows what is going to happen but he somehow lays his head down every night and sleeps and gets up every morning to meet the masses and every step is one step closer to Calvary.
And he did that for us. He did that for all of humanity. He did that for everyone who, even as we talked about tonight in the book of Isaiah, who sees their sin and says, I don't want that anymore. But would have no other way of rectifying. Would have no other way of truly being clean in God's eyes. Would have no other way of truly having hope and confidence in their relationship with God and in the hope of heaven. And so each night, he walked out to the Mount of Olives, and each morning, he walked into the temple. Until, some point tomorrow, he would do that for the last time. Now, I say these things not because I'm putting stock in this tradition of Holy Week, but it's not a bad time to center our thoughts on just what Jesus went through. Now, I'm not trying to make light of what he suffered on the cross or prior to it or anything of that nature, but I don't know about you, but sometimes the waiting is worse than anything, right? Right? Well, on that Wednesday night, that's where Jesus found himself, waiting. Waiting to do what he had to do. Waiting for what he had been born to, what he had been striving to for 33 years. but also waiting to go home. Waiting for the end of that difficult, laborious, hard road that he walked in life. Waiting to return to glory, to return to the Father, and wait for us. And that's where he is now. These are just things that kind of bounced around in my head this week as I've had discussions with people at work and, and others about what this week is and things of that nature. And I think it's always good. And I do always have a little bit of a soft spot for Easter for personal reasons. It's never a bad thing to remember what Jesus did and why he did it. And that there was a whole lot more going on than just a corrupt trial and the cruelty of man against man. There was also the love of God and the compassion of a good shepherd. If we can help you tonight to know him, we want to do that. If we can help you and serve you in any way tonight, please let us know as we stand and as we sing. One, two, and four. Why do you wait, dear brother? Oh, why do you tarry so long? Your Savior is waiting to give you in his sanctified throng. Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? What do you hope 
Dear brother, to gain by a further delay, there's no one to save you but Jesus, there's no other way but his way. Why not, why not, why not come to him now? Why not, why not, why not come to him now? Why do you wait, dear brother? The harvest is passing away. Your Savior is longing to God bless you. There's danger and death in delay. Why not, why not, why not come to him now? Why not, why not, why not come to him now? few announcements before we're dismissed. Um, the 23rd of April uh, at 1 p.m. here at the Fellowship Hall will be a baby shower for uh, Leah Grillioni, uh, Gary and Wilma's granddaughter. Uh, it will be at 1 o'clock. Shirley and Isabel are the hostesses, and if you have any questions, uh, I'm sure they can answer any questions. And also, if you plan to attend, let them know so that they can plan for refreshments. Uh, our Bible Bowl is coming up on the 27th of April. That will be on the book of Job, which we're studying, so read ahead. Um, our birthday fellowship is April 24th. I know I'm going out of chronological order here, but just go with me. Uh, we did get something in the mail uh, the other day, and the West Visalia Church of Christ will be hosting the area-wide monthly singing, and that is Friday the 22nd. Desserts will be served following the singing. So West Visalia, Friday, April 22nd, 7 p.m., if you're able to attend. Um, April 29th, the Friends of Yosemite Bible Camp meeting at Woodward, uh, is meeting at Woodward Park. Uh, April 30th, the Yosemite Bible Camp, huh? Changed, 23rd. It's been changed. Well, it's not changed here. I think you just need it. Oh. Okay. April 23rd, the Friends of YBC meeting at Woodward Park. At camp. Okay. <laughs> FYBC is still the 29th, but the men's meeting is the 23rd. Okay. Did everybody get that? Because I'm, I didn't. So, um, is there anything else that needs to be announced before we're dismissed in prayer? Let's go to our Father in prayer. Loving Father, we're so grateful for all of the blessings you give to us each and every day. And Father, for the time that we've had here this evening to study from your word and to learn your will for us here on this earth. Father, may we be good stewards, may we be good children of yours, and may we always hold your banner and your son's banner high so that souls will be saved. Father, go with us, keep us always in your loving care, guide us and guard us in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen.